Hello, and welcome to What's New in Aerospace. This program is coming to you from the National Air and Space Museum, and we're here in the Moving Beyond Earth exhibit as a part of a program brought to you by Boeing. I'm here today with Dr. Roger Lanius, who was the former associate director here for curatorial affairs, and previous to that was the NASA historian. And so, Roger, this is a wonderful place for us to get to talk about your new book because we're on a stage that you helped us build. Yes, indeed. This is a great uh, exhibition, and I would urge everybody to t spend some time in here. But more importantly than that, in partnership with NASA and Google, we were able to build this exhibition to tell the story of space flight since the moon landings, which was a major step for us when this gallery first opened about, what, eight or nine years ago. Yes. So, so it's a great place to get to talk to about your newest book, uh, The Smithsonian History of Space Exploration. And um, so what makes this a Smithsonian book? There are so many books about a space exploration. You've written many of them. Um, what makes this the definitive Smithsonian history of space exploration? Well, one of the things that, uh, that I did in this particular book was uh, use imagery, and some of which you've seen before. There's no question about that. But there's also imagery from the NASA artifacts, that some of which are on display here and uh, tell the story of space flight through these objects. And we went international. We tried to tell the full story of space exploration. So there's, there's American, there's Russian, but there's a whole lot of other nations that are involved that we mostly don't pay that much attention to, but have a, a, a really big role in the, in the history of this particular endeavor. So one of the artifacts that I noticed that you had in the book starts perhaps a little earlier than we might have thought about. Um, you've got a picture in there of a, what is it, a rocket propelled harpoon that was actually used in whaling. Right, right. Well, so one of the, uh, uh, the things that I tried to do in the book was to go back to really the ancient era where people began to think about astronomy and what was out there. But also when technology started to be developed and the rocket is the core technology that allows us to explore space. So that history goes back several hundred years mostly used as weapons, but also used for other sorts of purposes. And this whaling harpoon that was rocket powered, um, there's an image from, uh, from the book uh, associated with that, as well as an object that's in the collection that uh, helps us tell that particular story. So we've worked together in, uh, when you were at NASA headquarters as the chief historian um, for a dozen years over there. I wasn't there for the full dozen, but you were leading that history, space history program. And then you came to the National Air and Space Museum and were the chair of the space history department. Right. Uh, so this space history that often starts with uh, Sputnik, October 4th, 1957, this is a story that's really well known to you. Um, right. What can you do new with that by bringing these objects into the conversation? Well, we're able to kind of uh, conceptualize it in a slightly different way. It's a fairly standard story that most people have heard in some form. You know, October 4th of 1957 is the launch of Sputnik. It was a major event. It, it signaled the beginning of the space age in the truest sense of the term, but it was commemorated in a lot of different ways. And so such things as this little uh, uh, object that uh, is in the in the collections of the museum was a nice way to help tell that particular story and we've done that repeatedly through the book where we've talked about an event talked about the way in which it is uh, shown used objects from the collection to uh, to help to illustrate that so the history that's in here you say really starts from the ancient world to the extraterrestrial future mm -hmm. um, and there are parts of this that you've been over any number of times in your uh, publication. So part of what I was thinking about as I was looking at the book is wondering, you know, how when you're compiling something that is this comprehensive, um, what are some of the stories that you're really trying to bring into this? So, you know, for oh, instance, Robert Goddard. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, we tell the story of Robert Goddard, the first uh, person to successfully launch a uh, liquid-fueled rocket in 1926. That's an important story. It's a, it's a, 
a relatively well-known story, but there is a huge collection of Goddard materials that are a part of this museum's collections, and many of them are on display in the building. So we talk about that, and we use those collections. Uh, we also talk about uh, Werner von Braun and the German rocket team and their efforts to build the V2. Uh, but interestingly enough, when I started looking at that story, which is fairly well known in terms of World War II, there's also a lot of other pieces to that story. Every major combatant in World War II built, built missiles of some type, rockets of some type that were used for military purposes. And so uh, the image of a rocket salvo being fired by an American warship in World War II, and those were common, uh, was something unique that I didn't know very much about. And uh, as I said, every nation was engaged in using this type of weaponry. And it's a story that hasn't been told very much. We don't often connect that to the human spaceflight story that comes afterward. Um, so what were you able to do as you were looking into that human spaceflight story? Where did that take you? Well, one of the things that, that, that I started looking at was uh, both the Americans and the Russians uh, in the late 1950s choose astronauts and cosmonauts that are going to engage in this activity, something that's never been done before, no human had ever been in space, and they both choose uh, individuals who've been involved in high-performance military jet aircraft operations. And I talk a bit about the training, which was unique. How do you train somebody to go do something that's never been done before? It's not an easy task. And uh, how do you prepare them for the rigors of that environment? One of the things that, uh, that I found then were training pictures from both the Americans and the Russians, and we began to tell that particular story. There's also uh, the story of Yuri Gagarin, the first human in space, and of course the first Americans that followed. Well, I'd love to go back an image, please, because uh, that, I think, is not the picture that we're used to of, um, you know, so who were those gentlemen? And um, can you tell us a little bit about this image? This is not our usual view of the Mercury 7 astronauts it, who were it, chosen it, in 1959. It, it is not a standard image uh, for, for lots of reasons. Uh, they have been on survival training. Uh, didn't know necessarily where they were going to come down, so they had to be prepared for just about anything. So they took them out and dropped them in the middle of nowhere and told them to survive for a period of time. Uh, and they did so, uh, but as you can see, uh, at the end of this particular experience, they're a little disheveled, uh, and they're dirty, and they're tired, and they're cold, and they're hungry, most of all. But, uh, but they did survive, and we found this on both sides. The Americans and the Russians are both engaged in the same kinds of things. So famous, that's uh, Alan Shepard in the center, who's in, the first in American the center. in This space. is the Mercury 7, uh, the famous astronauts of, uh, of Alan Shepard, John Glenn. Uh, you can see uh, all of the others that are there with them. So I just, I think it's um, really interesting when you get to take a look at how they were preparing and all of the ways that they were really trying to think about what are the unknown unknowns? How do they right. prepare themselves as, as best that they could? So with uh, Yuri Gagarin and the uh, Soviet program, you were looking at that training as well and telling that history of that astronaut, um, Yuri Gagarin, and really trying to bring us into that story. Can you tell us a little bit about what you were able to uncover and put in the book about the Soviet program? Yeah, it's interesting because the Americans and the Soviets were engaged in this, obviously, this space race. Uh, ultimately, it took the Americans to the moon. The Soviets tried their darndest to reach the moon. They were not successful in doing so. Uh, and while all the time publicly saying they weren't involved in a race at all, they really were, and they built a lot of hardware, and they did a lot of activities. But the activities between the two sides, they're sort of mirror image twins. The Americans are engaged in certain types of things. The Russians are doing almost the same thing. Uh, if the Russians are first to do something, the Americans uh, proceed very quickly to try to recover from that and uh, do the same sort of thing or something that uh, was one step greater. And uh, you, you see this over and over and over again. There's lots of uh, imagery that we have not seen that much in the West of training exercises that look an awful lot like the, uh, the activities of the, of the astronauts in Houston as they're 
put into simulators and, and forced to do all kinds of, uh, of activities that would be useful in space, uh, not so much on Earth. Uh, we also did some artwork associated with this uh, particular book that uh, hasn't been seen before. And, uh, and, and this is especially true for the Russian program, which was a, a secret effort. And so the, the, uh, the early capsule that the, uh, the Russians built uh, is in two, state, two parts, basically. And uh, we are able to depict that in imagery like you see here. Uh, of how it would come apart, the ball-shaped pieces where uh, the cosmonaut would come home. Uh, the rest of it is just uh, uh, retro-packed and be thrown away. And, uh, and that has not been really been seen in lots of places before. I loved in the book how much you were really able to bring in these international stories. Um, we are in the National Air and Space Museum. And we are very familiar, I think, with the US history, especially of human space flight. And we're coming up on a really important milestone in that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk for a minute about the place of, say, Apollo 11 or the Apollo program in this book? Well, obviously, uh, the Apollo program gets a full chapter in the book, as it should. Uh, it, it was an astounding achievement. And uh, I'm, I'm going to stipulate that we actually did land on the moon. If anybody disagrees with me, we can have a long, very long conversation until I convince you that we did indeed land on the moon. But we did. Uh, and the astronauts engaged in that, that's a very well-known story. Uh, the image that you see here is the planting of the flag at Apollo 11. Uh, that's Buzz Aldrin uh, saluting the flag as it, uh, uh, as it is just planted. And, uh, and they snap that picture very quickly. And I tell this story in the book. Um, it's not very easy to get a flag, planted, uh, get a flag planted on the moon. Uh, the regolith is uh, not really susceptible to that very well. So they were concerned it was going to fall over. So they, they got it in there. He backed up a couple of steps. They took a picture because they were afraid that any second is just going to end up in the dust. Uh, but it, it didn't, and it turned out great. But that inspiration of Apollo, not just the Apollo 11 landing, but the entire program, becomes really a catalyst for activities around the world. And it's a fascinating thing to look at, because I didn't know that much about that when I started working on the book. Um, even before the landings themselves, various other nations who had some wherewithal uh, began to engage in this, often in partnership with either the US or the Soviet Union, or in some cases, both. Uh, they were working with both sides to, to, uh, to kind of enhance their capability to do things in space. And the image you see here is one of the truly striking ones that, I, that is in the book. Uh, this is uh, uh, the first satellite built uh, by the Indian Space Agency and uh, being moved from one location to another in the, uh, in, in the most uh, primitive of ways possible. But it did make some sense. Uh, the roads were not good from where they were going uh, between the two locations. Uh, an ox cart worked very well. It had very good suspension. And so that's how they moved the spacecraft. Um, but it really is a, a unique juxtaposition to show what they were doing. Now, that program has really advanced uh, in the period since the mid-1960s um, when this photograph was taken. And India has a very strong space program today, engaged in all kinds of activities. But other nations did this too. And uh, what we see in the aftermath uh, of Apollo in the 1970s is a real flowering of, of national efforts around the globe and uh, continuing right up to the present, expanding right up to the present, to, the, to where today, and I talk about this in the book, there is a space race still underway. But interestingly enough, it's an Asian space race between various nations there who are seeking to uh, engage in very aggressive activities, uh, not because of Cold War uh, uh, concerns in that particular region, but because of the technical, the economic, the military, the commercial applications that result from those, uh, those endeavors. And there's a very aggressive effort uh, by all of the countries uh, in Asia to do various things. Surprisingly, places like Indonesia, which you wouldn't necessarily think too much of a, as having a, a large aggressive space program, but it actually does. 
And it entered the program because as a nation that is a, a succession of islands spread across the Pacific, uh, they wanted communication satellites to be able to communicate from one side of the country to the other. And that drove their initial activities and they moved on from there. Lots of other things along the same lines. Bangladesh had its first communication satellite just this year, which That's, was a very big deal yes. in that nation and in that part of the world. And some of those nations have, have gone on to uh, develop human programs uh, in partnership with the Americans or the Russians. And uh, some of them are talking about building their own launchers that uh, will take their own astronauts into space in some future date. So we've talked a lot about human space flight, but one of the things that I really liked that you did with this Smithsonian history of space exploration is the way that you included not only human space flight, but also planetary exploration right. and looking at that. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about, you know, you have this wonderful picture in there of Carl Sagan standing next to the Viking lander, um, which is actually the Viking lander that we have here at the National Air and Space Museum in the Boeing Milestones of Flight Hall. So that pic famous picture of him in his anorak and his turtleneck standing next to that um, backup spacecraft for the Viking that was actually on Mars. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the beginnings of planetary exploration. Sure, absolutely. I spent a fair amount of time uh, talking about the planetary exploration program. And uh, it, it goes back to the very early part of the 1960s. 60s, the Americans and the Russians are engaged in efforts to, to reach uh, Venus as the first planet that was the target for, for both of these nations. Um, the Americans had a little bit of success early on. Uh, the Russians had some a little bit later on, including a, a soft landing on Venus that the Americans have never done. And, um, and, and Mars gets its whole chapter because it's such a fascinating place and there's so much uh, belief wrapped up in that and so many missions that have been undertaken there that, um, that there's a lot of activity uh, associated with Mars. That's where the, the picture of the, uh, the Viking lander with Carl Sagan is is shown and, uh, and, and of course Viking was built around the concept of can we look for life there? And there were, were experiments that were trying to uh, find biomedical signatures that would uh, help us understand that. We didn't find that and I don't think it's an accident that we didn't go back to Mars for almost 20 years uh, in the aftermath of the failure to find any evidence of life on, on Mars. But in the 1990s, that changes where we find lots of evidence that there may have been past life on Mars uh, and that Mars was once a watery planet. And if that's the case, water, liquid water is a building block, fundamental building block of life on Earth. We would suggest the same is true in other places. And so a follow the water approach to exploration of Mars has been undertaken both by NASA, uh, by the European Space Agency, by the Russians and so forth. And there's a lot of effort to try to understand Mars and how it might have evolved over time and whether or not uh, there might actually be some evidence of past life there or, have, or possibly even some evidence of current life there. Now, if they no, were, we're able not to find thinking, it. like wave at no, us. No, 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 we're not talking about ET that you can talk to. <laughs> uh, what we are talking about probably is microorganisms of some type, if there are, is anything at all. And, uh, and that's, that's going to be true for most places, certainly in the solar system. Uh, it's not someone that we could communicate with. It's, uh, it's some entity that might not like us very much, that we might be not very good in terms of relating to and them relating to us um, because we could get sick. But uh, that's the, uh, th those are the possibilities. I do go beyond this, and I'm fascinated by the discovery of extrasolar planets just in the last uh, uh, 20 years now, basically, that we've been able to determine that there are extrasolar planets. In fact, lots of them, some of them were probably Earth-like at some point, uh, or were perhaps at some point in their history. And uh, the potential for life beyond this, uh, this solar system, I think, is very real. Doesn't mean they're visiting us, doesn't mean that they even know we exist, but I do believe they're out there. And that's the fundamental question. I kind of frame a lot of the planetary exploration as well as uh, extrasolar exploration is built around 
I think, a core question in spaceflight, which is, are we alone in the universe? And that's a question everybody at NASA wants to know the answer to, and I would think a whole lot of people elsewhere do as well. Um, spend time, spend a lot of time talking about the Hubble Space Telescope, the other great observatories that NASA has been engaged in, um, the uh, the particles and cosmic rays and things of this nature that doesn't get a lot of play in the mainstream, but I think is really important in the context of our understanding of the universe. So turning back to kind of more terrestrial, how we're going to, what are the next generation vehicles that we can be looking at um, for carrying out some of this exploration? We're very familiar with the kind of, the, we've talked about the de development of liquid-fueled rockets right. starting with the Second World War. What's coming next? Well, one of the th interesting, I mean, the space shuttle was, um, well, has been retired, and that story is told in this particular gallery uh, quite well. The, uh, uh, the Soyuz is continuing to fly, but there is all this effort to build the next generation vehicles. And, um, and NASA has contracted with uh, SpaceX, uh, Elon Musk Corporation, to provide uh, commercial cargo services to the International Space Station. Eventually, uh, human space activities that can take astronauts to the space station are a part of this as well. And uh, the Jeff Bezos uh, company has also uh, been engaged, and here you can see a picture of him with the uh, Smithsonian Secretary, David Scorton, um, uh, to engage in these sorts of activities as well. So we're moving in a direction that will give us multiple launchers to get into Earth orbit. And once you are in Earth orbit, you are essentially halfway to anywhere else you want to go. And, uh, and that's where NASA wants to be because they want to move into uh, translunar activities to go back to the moon and maybe go on to Mars uh, and uh, ultimately to put research stations there and who knows maybe there's the opportunity to put colonies in space with humans living there there's a long history of this um, and uh, there's imagery in the book that talk about those kinds of efforts to uh, build long cylinders that would be located in space that would rotate. You had that wonderful picture of the Gerard O'Neill uh, conceptualization is. of what it might really look like if you were going to try to bring human yeah. culture into an artificial right. presence in uh, Earth orbit or at a Lagrangian point. Yeah, this is, a, uh, this is a piece of art that was done in 1977. Uh, there were summer studies done at NASA at that particular time about the possibility of building these long cylinders that would then rotate. And so there, you would live on the inside of these things, there would be gravity uh, at, the, at the bottom part of this, and so you can see it depicted. You've, and, and, and by the way, it looks a lot like Central California around, uh, around the Bay Area because the summer study was done in the Bay Area and they hired some artists to kind of depict what they were thinking about for that point in time. And so you can see folks in the foreground uh, with a um, uh, sort of a picnic underway. Uh, you see lakes, rivers, buildings, uh, places to live. Looks very, uh, very idyllic. Uh, but up in the top, where it's zero gravity at the center of this cylinder that is rotating, you can see a hang glider. And that hang glider can stay there all day because it's zero G. And that would be so cool. <laughs> so this book really takes us on a wonderful journey from uh, the vet development of rocketry to these kinds of concepts uh, through human spaceflight, planetary exploration, considering extrasolar planets. Um, I know that we have, I'm sure we have questions um, that people would love a chance to talk to the author. And so if we can put the picture of the book back up. Uh, if anyone would like to come over to the microphone, uh, introduce yourself and uh, ask a question. And um, do we have one already from online? Yeah, we have an online question from Jennifer, and she wants to know why there are no stars in the picture of the photo on the moon. <laughs> it has to do with the nature of photography, and you have to uh, set your f-stops at a point where you can get uh, very bright lit objects that are sort of in the center of the of the picture, like the astronaut in the white spacesuit, uh, the uh, lunar lander uh, that would also 
be very bright. And when you do that, you have to put the f-stop at a point where you get that perfectly lit and the stars in the background do not show up. It's, it's, an, it's an illusion associated with the difficulties of photography. I think we had one more question in the gallery. Yes, I'm, I'm David, and I just am reflecting off of your title. And curious, I know that you had the uh, rocket harpoon in there, but uh, what, anything older? I mean, uh, is, are you looking also at the dreams of flying to the moon and to the planets? Yes, I spent a lot of time talking about that. Uh, I mean, I go back to the ancients and the building of ancient observatories. I talk a little bit about uh, about famous uh, sites like Stonehenge and their relationship to astronomical observation. Um, I, I also talk about uh, very early ideas about what these points of light in the sky were. And uh, it's not till the scientific revolution that you began to realize that these are actual places that you might be able to visit some of them are stars, and obviously you don't want to go to those, but some of them are planets, and conceivably you could go to those. And as soon as that happens, uh, people begin to speculate on what you might find there. And there is lots of novels and stories that uh, result from that. For one thing, and I love to talk about this, Cyrano de Bergerac, uh, famous French polymath, I guess would be a good way to say it, <laughs> captain of the mm -hmm. king's guards and so forth, wrote a novel about this. And he uh, went to the moon in this particular novel. Uh, and uh, and the, the hero of the novel tried to do it in several ways. The most interesting way, I thought, was uh, a belief that if you just put dew into a bunch of bottles, dew like you find on the grass in the morning, uh, it evaporates up. So if you put it in bottles and wrap yourself in these bottles, you will be carried up. And that would be how you could get to the moon. Uh, now, by the way, it didn't even work in the novel. Uh, so, and I don't recommend trying it under any circumstances. But then he got a, uh, what amounted to a, uh, a, a, a little basket of some time, and they fixed firework rockets to it. And that's how he ended up going to the moon. And he had adventures there. But those sorts of stories become uh, sort of very common, especially in Europe, but also in, in China and other places, uh, as people begin to think about what it means uh, to go elsewhere. I think we have time for one more quick question. Hello, my name is Arthur. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned earlier about jet fuel, and I noticed on the space shuttle over there, most of it is fuel to take up and eject. Has it ever been considered using nuclear power? Space show, and if not, why not? So you can give that complicated answer in about 30 seconds. Oh, okay, all right. In 30 <laughs> seconds. Yes, it's been thought about. Uh, and there was a program in the 1960s to develop a nuclear rocket. It's called Rover Nerva. Uh, the program got to the point where they were actually able to do tests associated with the vehicle, but um, the fear was that it's, uh, that it's such a dangerous thing to use. If you have an accident, you've now irradiated who knows what all. And uh, so they backed away from that. Now there's been efforts to revive the concept of a nuclear rocket for in space propulsion only. And that may actually happen at some point, but we're not there yet. How's that for 30 seconds? Beautifully done, as is the book. Um, I love the depth of it, I love the illustrations of it, and I'm delighted that we got a chance to share it here as a part of what's new in aerospace. Uh, thank you to those of you who watched and who were with us. Thank you to Boeing for sponsoring the program, and thank you. And thank you all. <laughs>